And James, he gives us a series of tests. And if I've counted correctly, there are about 14 of them. And he gives us these tests so we can test ourselves by them. So we run these tests past our own lives and see if we are actually Christians as we think we are. And uh, what he has said so far is that tests or trials may come across your path and they are to be rejoiced in because when you pass this test of trials, then you become mature and complete and not lack, lacking anything, such as the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. I don't know if it's coincidence, but God uh, delivered them by ten plagues, and when they went to the wilderness, there were ten tests, and they failed all of them. And so God, in the end, said they will not enter his rest. So we need to respond to the test that God sends us, in a, in, a, in a Christian manner because if the test is used in the wrong way, we can turn it into a temptation. But the temptation doesn't come from God. The test is from God, but our own sinful nature, our own fallen nature, uh, our own wickedness can turn a test into a temptation. And James makes it very clear, God does not tempt us. In fact, we are dragged away and enticed by our own wicked desires. It's not, God's re it's not God's fault if we fail the test. And he says sin is like, it's like as a, a conception. It starts in the mind and then it has a gestation period, a period like almost like a baby in the womb. And then after it's full grown, it, 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 it's born. And when it's born, it gives birth to death. So what we see in, in many people's lives, and maybe in our own lives, is that there are certain things we did when we were young. And we give these things a foothold in our lives. And as the years go on and we keep this, this close to our hearts, maybe other people don't know about it, this thing can grow and become bigger and bigger until a point where we cannot control it anymore. So the question is, he says, how do we as Christians respond to the word of truth planted in us, the word that gave us new birth? We've get, we have to get rid of moral filth. He said last week we looked at that. Get rid of moral filth. Control our tongue and our thoughts. And we have to treat our neighbor as God desires. And today we will focus on this test, this test of how we treat our neighbor, the test of impartial love. How do we respond to those who are, in our eyes, less than what we are? Maybe they are less educated. Maybe they are less privileged. They're not the same social class. They may be from a different uh, ethnic group. They may speak a different language. They may have a different culture. They may be poor. How do we respond to those people and specifically Christians because obviously he's looking at the life of a Christian and we need to respond in a certain way to our Christian brothers and sisters and those who are countrymen that may, be, may not necessarily be, be of our faith but they are our neighbor and he goes through this by the following means he first states a principle what is the Christian principle? Then he develops the theme through giving us a practical example, a theological argument, and then some scripture quotations. So what is the principle? Well, the principle is stated in verse 1. He says, my brothers, which is Christians. He's speaking to Christians. He's not speaking to the people out there. He's speaking to believers. As believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ Christ, do not show favoritism. Why should we as Christian believers not show favoritism? As believers in our glorious Lord as he states. Because Jesus himself never displayed favoritism. He never exhibited favoritism. Even his enemies recognized that. Remember when they sent the, 
the, the Pharisees sent some of their disciples and the Herodians to test him. And they said, teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity. And you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Now, whether they meant it or not, I don't know. But normally when people want to set a trap for you, they, they say something which is true so that you can become at ease and then they spring the trap. The life of Jesus never displayed any favoritism. If you think about this, if you start with his genealogy, there are some people, unmentionable people in there. Rahab the prostitute, Boaz's son, who was most probably shunned by society and eventually had to marry Ruth, a Moabitess, when he was an old man. And so we can go on. Bathsheba and David with the adulterous affair. And all these people are in Jesus' genealogy. And then he gets born in a stable. He does a menial job. I don't know whether he was a carpenter, but he was the carpenter's son. So I assume he worked with his dad in the carpentry business. He had one set of clothes. He no, had no place to sleep. He was persecuted. He hung around with prostitutes and tax collectors and fishermen, the ruffian zealots, all the ruffians of society. They were the people that he welcomed if they were willing to change, if they were willing to look for healing. The demon possessed. Jesus never showed any favoritism. He preached near the Sea of Galilee where the, the Jews that lived there were a bit backward. And he went to Samaria where there was a mix of Jewish and Eastern races that under the Assyrian Empire they were all mixed up. And Jews in general wouldn't even speak to Samaritans. But Jesus went there on his ministry. And so we as people of faith in Jesus, we should be like our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. We can't be different. And that's also the character of God. Because in Deuteronomy 10 verse 17 and 18, we read that the Lord our God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords. He shows no partiality. He accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless, the widow, and he loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. What's so special about orphans and widows and aliens? Well, they were the vulnerable in society. They were the people who couldn't look after themselves. And that expands on what James said in verse 27. The religion that God our Father accepts in 127 is as pure as faultless, and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows. Then J James goes on and he says, maybe you don't understand what I'm saying. Let me give you a real life example. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and then a poor man comes and he's got shabby clothes on. Do you pay special attention to the man with the fine clothes and say, here's a nice seat for you and for the poor man you sit at my feet or you sit down there? And then he says, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges? Now it's interesting that he says, suppose a man comes to your meeting. It could be a church meeting, but the word that he uses there is the word for gathering. It could be a, a court, a church court, where a dispute has to be settled between, between two parties. It's interesting that in this passage, again and again, he, he uses the word judge or judging in verse 4. If you look at verse 4, it says, um, Have you not discriminated and become judges? And then in verse 6 again, are, are they not the rich, the ones dragging you to court? And in verse 12 again, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. So there's this whole talk of judgment 
there's this talk of sitting at certain places, at certain levels, and having certain clothes. And the one man clearly is a poor man because he has poor, he's got shabby clothes on. The other one is a wealthy man, he has a ring and fine clothes. James never uses the word rich. That's just uh, as an aside. He never uses the word rich for Christians. When he uses the word rich, it's always derogatory. When he speaks of the rich, he means the pagans. People who, are, who have money, but they are not Christians. He will never call a Christian the rich in this letter. And he says, you know, we need to treat these two people the same. If we don't, then we have judged. We've become like the rich. We've become like the people of the world. We look at someone at his attire, what he's dressed in, and we make a judgment, a value judgment on that. It's interesting that in a Jewish court, the, the principle was that if two people came to court, they had to dress in the same way. If a wealthy man and a poor man came, then the wealthy man had to dress in the same poor, shabby clothes as the poor man. Or he had to buy fancy clothes so that the poor man could be presented in the same way. They also had to sit at the same level in the court of law so that the judge wouldn't be biased and look at the two people in front of him and immediately think that the poor man must be the guilty man. And unfortunately, my friends, in our society and I think abroad, uh, the poor people are the ones who are normally at the short end of the stick because they, they, they can't uh, afford fancy lawyers, they can't afford fancy clothes, and James says we must not be like that. If we as a church or as Christians ex accept that kind of discrimination, then we have become like the world. We cannot judge people according to what they wear, what social status they have, what ethnic status they have, or whatever else we may decide is an important distinctive. The next thing that he mentions is God's view of the poor. Notice in verse 5, he says, Listen, my dear brothers. Now he's now moved on from brothers to dear brothers. Dear brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Here he presents a theological argument. He's given us the principle, he's given us an example, and now he's giving, giving us a theological argument. Why does God show interest in the poor? Why? Have you ever thought about that? Because that is how God knows. And this is how we can show God that we truly love him. The Apostle John, the Apostle of love, as he was, he was first called the son of thunder, and then later on when he calmed down, he was called the Apostle of love. He writes in 1 John 3, 17, he says, If anyone has material possessions, and sees his brother, his fellow believer, in need, but has no pity on him. How can the love of God be in him? How can you say that you love God whom you have not seen, but you do not love your brother whom you have seen? And the simple idea is this. You can't give God a new set of clothes. You can't give God a sandwich and a cup of coffee. You can't give God a room for the night. You can't use it. But you can do that for the poor. You can do that for your poor fellow believer. And God shows a special interest in how the poor are treated in the Bible. One of the reasons for the exile to Babylon, you know what one of the reasons were? One was, of course, the worship of false gods. You know what the other one was? The way they treated and exploited the poor and the vulnerable in society. You can just go and read Jeremiah 7, Isaiah 58. I wish we can read it all now. I'll just give a quote from Jeremiah 7, verse 4. It says, the prophet speaks to the people of Jerusalem, and he says, do not trust in deceptive words and say, 
This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You know, you can hear how religious they were. They were going to the temple, oh, this is the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your action and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, I will let you stay. What did, he, what did he mean by shedding innocent blood? Did, they, did he mean that they killed people in the temple? No. They were exploiting the poor. Withholding wages from the poor in God's eyes is like shedding innocent blood. That's how God sees it. Because the poor need the daily wage to survive. He hasn't got a salary. He hasn't got a bank account. He hasn't got money stored up for those days that he can't work. So when you withhold or you underpay the poor in God's eyes, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah, and James says it is like shedding innocent blood. He, he goes on to quote this passage later again in the book of James. Jesus himself said, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, that there are two kinds of people. At the end of the day, at the end of time, when the Son of Man returns, there will be, be these two groups of people, sheep and goats. And what's the difference between sheep and goats? Well, the sheep are those who treat the poor and the vulnerable in society in a certain way. They visit the sick. They clothe the naked. They visit those in prison. They give food to the hungry. That's what sheep do. You don't do those things to become a sheep. When you are a sheep, you will do that. And if you don't do those things, you are a goat. As simple as that. That's how Jesus explains that. Now, does James mean that all the poor people are Christians and wealthy people are not? No, that's not what he says. He says... In verse 5, not all are chosen for salvation. Not all the poor are chosen for salvation. Only those who love him. He makes it very clear. Not all are chosen for salvation. Only those who love him. The point is not that God loves the poor and hates the wealthy. The point is that the church should not judge as the world judges. It's difficult to be a Christian when you are wealthy. Very, very difficult. We see, and again, study after study shows that those countries where there's great poverty, generally the church is thriving. The church is expanding. And many people need God because they've got nothing else. So they desperately need God. But in many societies, especially in Western Europe, I was reading and listening to a, a, a missionary who was in Germany. And he says, the church is dead. In every single town, there's a beautiful church building. If you go there on a Sunday, it's closed. Maybe once a year, twice a year, it's open for something. Like the Easter Bunny Fair or some other... Christmas, Father Christmas or something. But other than that, there's nothing going on. It's spiritually dead. Austria, Switzerland, Germany. Those places, the church is dead. Belgium. The people there do not need, do not need God. They do not need God. They think they are self-sufficient. Notice what he says in verse 6 and 7. He says, but you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are dragging you, exploiting you, dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who slander the noble name of Jesus? They are the ones who say, you are the followers of that accursed Galilean, the Nazarene sect, or whatever else they would use. They hate the Christians. And now, when you're in a, in a church court, you or in a church service, you treat the poor in the same way as the world does, showing that you have the heart of the world. And James says, this cannot be, brothers and sisters. That's the way that pagans act and do. 
we as Christians cannot act in the same way towards our brothers and sisters. We then become prosecutors. We become judges that merits, uh, measures a man or a woman's merit on the way that they are dressed, on the language that they speak, or the way they appear to us. There's a royal law he mentions, and he quotes two passages from the Old Testament. And uh, the, aunt, the question here is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible actually say about all this? And the first thing is there, the royal law. It says in verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreaker. What is this royal law? The royal law is the law that sums all of it up. It sums up the whole totality of it. It's the law that says everything that all the other laws says. So if you say the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself, it includes all the other laws. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not murder, do not covet, honor your parents. All those. That is summed up in the royal law because it's the law above all other laws. Remember when Jesus was tested by another group uh, of people who came to him and said, what, are, what is the greatest commandment? He said, it's the greatest commandment is this, is that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, which is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Because how... Can you show that you do love God in this way? By loving your neighbor. Again, I cannot do anything for God. God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need a temple. God doesn't need clothes or food or anything. But I show my love for God by the way that I treat my neighbor. That is how the royal law is demonstrated. It's the principle to sum up all duties to neighbors. It's the summary or the totality of the law to show that you love God. Now, there may be an objection. You may say, well, you know, can partiality be seen as such a serious thing? You know, we have this history of X, Y, or Z. You know, we, we don't trust people from that group because of the past. Or we don't trust people because normally people dress like that. If you give them the meal, they'll jump over my wall at night and steal my lawnmower or something. That's how we think. Is it not? We don't want to show them what's in my backyard because he may come back at night if I give him a sandwich and a cup of coffee and then the next morning my garden tools are missing. And that's how we think. And he, we, we, we make this objection and we say, but partiality can't be such a serious sin. I mean, there are worse sins like murder and adultery. No, what does James say? He says in verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at one point is break, guilty of breaking all of it. The law is a whole. It's like, it's like having a huge mirror in your home where you look at yourself in the mirror when you've done your exercise and you put on your makeup and you stand there and somebody comes and takes a brick and slams it in, into the mirror. The law is like a mirror. When you break it, you break the whole thing. And it's interesting that he uses adultery and murder. You know why? Because those two carried with it the penalty of death in the Old Testament. Now, if I'm not an adulterer, but I'm a murderer at heart, the penalty is death. If I'm a murderer, but not an adulterer, then the penalty is still death. If I'm both, the penalty is still death. You can only die once. So it doesn't matter which you break. You're guilty, and you will die. And by showing favoritism to the wealthy and denying justice to the poor, we might be withholding 
that is due to the poor man because he can't afford the lawyer. He can't afford to put on fancy clothes so that the, the judge or the church court can decide favorably towards him. No, my friends, the law of God is a whole. You keep the whole law. If you break one part of the law, you are guilty of breaking it all. He concludes the concluding appeal that he has. And what is it? He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Speak is what you do on the outside. It's what you say, what's inside of you, you speak, it comes out of you. And you act, it's also on the outside. People can see that. It's covering all of your behavior. It's outward action, but it shows what's in your heart. What you speak and what you do shows what's in your heart. You cannot speak in a certain way and act in a certain way towards someone who is poor or somebody who is destitute or somebody who is vulnerable or someone who is an alien or the fatherless or the widow and then say you are inside a child of God when your actions and your speech deny that. The standard by which you will judge, be judged, the standard is the Old Testament. Law of God, as, as interpreted by Jesus. Remember, it says in the Ten Commandments, do not commit murder. What did Jesus say? Well, if you look at someone in anger, you have the heart of a murderer. So Jesus interprets it and explains it. So you have to take the Old Testament law as Jesus explained it and expanded it and and completely demonstrated it to us. It's not just saying, Jesus, Jesus, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. No, my friend, Jeremiah says, what do you do? What do you do? Jesus says, if you hear these words of mine and you put them into practice, not just saying, Lord, Lord, I did miracles in your name. I drove out demons. I did all these wonderful things. Finally, why must we act? Apart from all that has been said so far, apart from the theological principle, apart from the teaching from Scripture, why must we act in such a merciful way to the poor? Because judgment is coming. Judgment is coming, my friends. You know what one of the Beatitudes says? Be merciful. For those who are merciful, they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And it says judgment without mercy will be shown, in verse 13, to anyone who has not been merciful. We need to be merciful. When we see someone which we, in our judgment, which is often wrong, has got the wrong clothes, the wrong attitude, the wrong makeup, the wrong situation in life, what do we do? We need to be merciful. We need to be merciful. We don't know what that person has gone through to bring them to that point in their lives. Because we want God one day to be merciful to us. I once again want to mention the, the social workers. You know, you know why I, I like social workers, but it, it's, it's really amazing to me that these people, many of them are not even Christians. In, the, in fact, the vast majority of them are not even Christians. But you know one thing that they, what they exhibit and display? They've got a heart for the poor and the vulnerable and the miserable in society. And they will work in difficult circumstances and often without any recognition or any salary to add it to on top of it to try and help people whom society has discarded and said we can't do anything for them. That is what God means. 
That is what Jesus means. This is what James the Apostle means, that mercy displays a true kingdom character. And the person, even the pagan, when he does something for the poor, you know what? He knows, he, she knows, in her heart, this is right. This is what God wants. He or she may not know God, but they will know in their heart when they do this, there's something right about this. This is what God wants. My friends, that is how we as Christians should be characterized by our love for the down and outs, the vulnerable, the poor, the destitute, the homeless, even the criminals. 